In this video, we'll be talking about the tetrapod limb development. This is a complicated topic to understand, but we would make it simple for you. Stay tuned till the end of this video and this concept would be nailed down. So what are tetrapods? Tetrapods are those animals which has four limbs like mammals, birds, reptiles, etc. Now, be it the hand of a human, leg of a cat, a flipper of a whale or the wing of a bat. All of that has a basic architecture, which is defined by stylopod, zygopod and autopod. Stylopod is basically the uh, femur and the humerus. The zygopod comprises the fivia tibia and the radius and ulna. The autopod comprises the tarsals and carpals and all these phalangeses. So now we understand that there is an intricate architecture in the tetrapod four limb. And this beautiful architecture is developmentally sculpted. But that's a difficult job to do it, right? If you can imagine how you can make this kind of intricate architecture, can you, can you uh, conceptualize how you would make it in the development? It's hard to understand, right? But in development, it is nicely sculpted. But it all starts with the simple structure. So we have to understand the embryonic landmark a little bit. Let's try to do that. So this is the pharyngeal mesoderm. This is the anterior lateral plate mesoderm. This is the posterior lateral plate mesoderm. And just opposite to the posterior plate mesoderm, there is a field, there is a zone of tissue which is defined as four limb field. It is not limb yet, but it is destined to be limb in the future. So this four limb field, which rather looks very simple, would eventually create a complicated structure or architecture like this. And this is a long journey. Question is how this kind of complex transformation really happens from the set point to the end point. It's a huge journey. So we can clearly understand this field, which was defined as a limb bud field, which eventually bulge out form a limb bud. And that limb bud extends, grow, creates bones, muscles, etc. underneath to ultimately form the four limb. Isn't it a long and beautiful journey? We would try to appreciate that. Now limb development is happening along different developmental axes. So that is why first we should start understanding the axis to get a better sense of the development. Here is a proximal to distal axis. Proximal means that is anything close, close to the body and distal means anything away from the body. Here is the dorsal to ventral axis and here is posterior and anterior axis. Dorsal means anything which is basically at the back uh, and, and the belly side is basically ventral. So you can see your pump is basically ventral and the outside of your pump is basically dorsal. Now, just like a developed hand or developed leg has its own architecture and developmental axis, you would have the similar kind of axis in that precursor of the limb. That means the limb bud. Limb bud has its own anatomical and developmental axis. So limb bud is the hero of this story because this is the first visible sign of limb development. Now, moral of the story, limb bud would eventually be patterned to create that extremely complicated structure. Now we have to understand why and how. So there are sequential processes. First, there would be induction of the limb field. Then eventually there would be outgrowth of the limb bud. And then the cell fate specification of limb bud would eventually lead to specific regions of the tetrapod limb. So now we can clearly appreciate this sequential process. Now, if we zoom in and cut a cross section of this embryo, we can see that there are different zones. You have to understand that this bud would eventually grow. Whenever there is a growth, you have to understand two mechanisms can operate. One is extensive proliferation and migration of nearby cells to that region. It turns out that underneath the limb bud, Migration of cells happens from hypaxial uh, myotome bud and lateral, myotum, uh, lateral plate mesoderm. So these limb and muscle precursor cells populate underneath that limb bud. 
So basic formula of making a hand is like you have to create a muscle, you have to create bones. Eventually, this basic architecture has to be innervated by blood vessels and nerve. So these precursor cells has to be defined. And these precursor cells are now coming just underneath the limb bud. Now the question is, once you have a lot of mesenchymal cells underneath this limb bud, how do you pattern them? How does a mesenchymal cell knows that it has to create a stylopod in future or zygopod in future or let's say autopod in future? How does this decision is made? And the answer is rather simple because in developmental biology, everything happens by instructions from morphogens. So is there any rule? Of course there is a rule. Question is who sets up this rule and how this rule is followed up and what happens if this rule is abrogated? So if we zoom in, we can see the lymph bud itself has defined anatomical regions. There is some region known as ZPA, zone of polarizing activity. Obviously the name suggests it has some sort of mor morphogen that polarize things. There is progressive zone which progresses and grows. So it has enough amount of stem cells. And ultimately the apical ectodermal ridge, which is a ectodermal apex of the developing lymph bud. So each of these region interacts with each other in synchrony and ultimately sculpt the development of the forelimb. Now let us look at three axes of development to understand what morphogenetic actions are happening there. So there is proximal to distal axis, there is anterior to posterior axis, and there is dorsal to ventral axis. Now in all these axes, different morphogen acts in a synchronous pattern. So in proximal to distal axis, retinoic acid and FGF8 or fibroblast growth factor 8 uh, acts. In anterior to posterior axis, there is SSH or sonic hedgehog gradient. In basically dorsal to ventral axis, there is wind and BMP gradient. Now each of these morphogen also interact among themselves. These are not isolated events. We break it down in an isolated fashion to understand it better. But all this is happening in synchrony underlying the lymph development. Now let us get back to the basics. Remember how morphogen works. There is a cell which would secrete the morphogen. Cells which are near the vicinity would get most of the morphogen which are away from the source would get least of the morphogen and that kind of sets up the interpretation differences, right? So ba basically there could be tissue specific competence, dynamics of morphogen in terms of time, signaling dynamics and transcription factor network which help the cell to interpret the morphogen dynamics and ultimately that lead to the different fate acquisition. Exactly the same mathematical formula applies in the tetrapod limb development. In a moment we would understand how. So first let's talk about the proximal to distal axis. Remember here retinoic acid and fibroblast growth factor opposing gradient operates in this region and based on the concentration threshold, there would be differential gene expression. Different Hox genes or homeobox genes would be expressed and each of them would be responsible to pattern certain portion of the limb. Now this is not this simple. There are complex network of uh, different transcription factors, tr regulators in this entire cascade. For the simplicity of this video, we are skipping that. In a later video, we would try to delve into details. Okay, now let's talk about the anterior to, now let's talk about the dorsoventral axis. In the dorsoventral axis, wind BMP acts, wind triggers the expression of LMX1B. It's a strong dorsalizing factor and LMX1B is selectively expressed in the dorsal side, not in the ventral side. So LMX1B is responsible or one of the key modulators which pattern the dorsal side. And it, these kind of understanding came from the mutant studies. In the control mouse, uh, if you cut up cross section across the paw, you can see this is the dorsal ventral axis. There is a paw, paw digits and these are the foot pad, which are ventral structures. In LMX1 a mutant mice, the foot pad is duplicated as if the dorsal structure become ventralized. Why is that? Because the strong determinant of the dorsal fate, LMX1B, was absent. It was mutated. This in turn tell us why LMX1B, which is under, un, uh, under the influence of wind signaling, is really important to pattern the dorsal side.
Now let's talk about the digit identity specification. SSH is a strong driving factor that determines this kind of specification. Two things matter, time duration of SSH expression and concentration of the SSH protein that is experienced by a receiver cell. So here you can see there are two cells which are destined to become digit 5 cell or digit 4 cell. And two of these cell has different kinetics or different temporal dynamics of the SSH expression. Digit 5 cell express SSH for longer duration compared to digit 4 cell. And that sets up the difference of autocrine signaling. This leads to the specification of digit 4 and 5. So clearly there is a complex set of rules. Digit 4 and 5 get specified based on the time duration of expression. Digit 3 is specified based on the SSH time, time of expression and also the concentration of SSH that is experienced from the source. Digit 2 is solely specified based on the SSH concentration that is experienced from the posterior side. And this digit 1 specification is completely SSH independent. So now you can see how the heterogeneity of the rule give rise to different digits in proper place. Now, it's important to note that SSH has a very strong function and it all came from the chick embryonic exp uh, experiment. A stage 19 to 23 chick embryo was used in this experiment where the ZPA uh, was there in the posterior side and people reasoned that the SSH is actually the driving factor which is coming out of the ZPA and polarize this kind of anterior posterior axis development. So in order to prove that they took or culture some fibroblast which is secreting SSH and they implant it to the anterior side just opposing to the ZPA. And if this signaling center is duplicated right now, the entire body axis gets duplicated. And what they found to their surprise, there is a mirror image in terms of the development. The limbs exhibit a mirror image digit duplication phenotype. So this internally, this exactly says that when SSH is ectopically produced, then the anterior margin of the limb bud becomes basically uh, mirror imaged to the posterior margin. So SSH is sufficient for the action of the ZPA. This is the moral of the story. Now this is a glimpses of limb bud development in human. You can understand how prolonged and a long process this is. It starts at week five and it kind of goes on till week eight. So it's a long process in space and time. Now let me tell you that underneath these morphogen gradient, there are strong correlation of homeobox genes which pattern the skeletal identity. Now we already know from other developmental biology lectures that homeobox genes kind of define body segments. And these body segments in the hand are actually defined by a rule of homeobox gene expression. Scientists notice that along these different region of the uh, limb, there are differential expression of homeobox genes. For example, Hox 9 and 10 are very strongly expressed in the stylopod region. Hox 11 is expressed in the zeugopod. Hox 12 and 13 is expressed in basically uh, near the autopod region. So already it looks like there is a combinatorial code. And the proof that a combinatorial code exists come from mutant experiments. So in a mouse mutant where Hox11 and Hox D, Hox A11 and Hox D11 are actually mutated, in that case, the scientists noticed that the zeugopod was totally absent. This in turn tells us that there is a rule. Zeugopod requires Hox11. Hox11 was now mutated. So the rule goes haywire and that lead to a problem in the zeugopod development. But look, other regions are developed properly. So now we can appreciate how intricate these rules are and how that sets in. Another example comes from humans. In human, there is basically a disease known as polysyndactyly, where the fingers of the hands fuse. So this is known as polysyndactyly. And when these people with polysyndactyly were sequenced, it was found that Hox the 13 locus, which is responsible for the autopods, that was mutated. 
Now it tells us that depends on which type of Hox genes are mutated and what part of the Hox code is jumbled up that lead to different kind of consequences. And that in turn tells us that the Hox code is important for limb development. Now we are kind of at the end of this video. Let me tell you this limb bud evolution happened long back. The fish didn't have any kind of like limb bud. So eventually there is a missing link between the fish and the amphibians. This is basically tiktalic. This is a fish with wrist and finger. Even fishes has that. So it was thought that when these fish was about to uh, move out from the aquatic environment to uh, explore the territorial environment. So they developed these kind of fingers and digits like thing, which is quite similar to human uh, or any kind of like tetrapod limbs. And eventually now in, uh, in basically tetrapods, we have defined sets of uh, our limbs, right? So the, basically the decision was set 375 millions ago. And this is a miss missing link. So I hope you enjoyed the video. In this video summary, I would like to emphasize on two points. We understood that this process of limb bud development was quite complicated. And this complicated process has to be done or executed by set of defined rules. Morphogen gradient sets up the rules in three developmental axes along the limb bud. We looked at that in quite a lot of details. And lastly, we also see that there are specific Hox gene rules that defines different regions of the limb like zygopod, stylopod, or autopod. So basically we can appreciate how precise molecular rules tunes the development of the mammalian tetrapod, um, uh, vertebrate limb development. So I hope this was useful. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can access our notes and flashcards from our website or from Facebook. So please support us using Super Thanks or pay us via Patreon. See you in next video.